Well, you guys shouldn't clap yet. You don't know what I'm about to say. It could just go <laughs> off the rails. All right, so I'm Chris. I'm a product manager at Google in our open data and analytics team. What that means, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about what that actually means and where we come from. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Ben, who's an engineer uh, on the team. He works specifically on a product called Cloud Data Proc. So a <clears throat> little perspective on, you know, uh, we're coming from Google, like I said. And Google, we've had a long history with the open source community going back all the way to about 2004 when we released you know, uh, the initial MapReduce paper, which ended up getting picked up by the community and Yahoo and others, and actually became the original Apache Hadoop. More recently, we've been actually contributing full code bases back to the open source community. Things like Apache Beam, a streaming framework or that actually runs on top of Spark, as well as TensorFlow, uh, probably a machine learning framework that most of you guys are familiar with. Now, on the flip side of those open source releases, we also now have Google Cloud, which is where Ben and I come from, which is a way you can go get these same exact open source distributions, but managed for you. You get the, you know, the SLAs, you get support, you get a you know, managed infrastructure without having to worry about running servers for that same open source code. And so a few examples of products that fall into our you know, open data space, we have TensorFlow, where if you want to just hand us a model, We'll take care of all like, the sizing of resources in our cloud ML engine. We have Apache Beam. So if you want to have you know, complex streaming applications, but without ever having to you know, deal with the underlying servers and scaling those and worrying about the architectures and operating system upgrades, Cloud Dataflow is a great way to do that. Recently, through an acquisition, we have CDAP, which is a, uh, it's, uh, an ETL platform, very GUI, very user friendly. Uh, and that can run completely serverless in Cloud Data Fusion. And this is actually a great way, it's a way to get a lot of people that uh, want to use Apache Spark, but might not be wanting to dig into Python code or even SQL. Uh, CDAP is a great open source application built on top of Apache Spark that can do that. And then another one that most of you probably are familiar with is Apache Airflow. It's a workflow orchestration that again, you know, if you want the full management of it, it's Cloud Composer. But Ben and I are from Cloud Data Proc. Our elevator pitch is that it's our fully managed Apache Spark and Apache Hadoop service. And while that's our pitch, usually, you know, what it really is, it's an open source engine for running all kinds of software from the open source. And we give you a lot of those same familiar open source tools. We really are this cluster orchestration for a lot of open source software. So if you wanted to you know, have a fully loaded Hadoop Spark cluster in about 90 seconds, that's something that you can get through Cloud Data Proc. We also give you really highly customizable machine types where you can say exactly the kinds of virtual machine sizes that you need. And our goal with Cloud Data Proc, this last highlight here, is that we really want to tightly integrate you with the rest of these cloud services. Our goal with our Cloud Data Proc, it's not to give you yet another cluster to manage. It is really about giving you uh, connections back into more cloud native ways of running open source software. And so our team, in addition to running these managed services, <coughs> we have a lot of connectors uh, that are in the open source that we uh, put out there that anyone can go use. So on Google Cloud, like you might be familiar with some of the way other cloud providers have done this in the past, where they you know, they have their own controlled internal version of a connector. And what we found is that created a lot of contention in the community where people had like different connectors for different distributions of Spark and it didn't make a lot of sense. And so we didn't take that approach. We actually put all of our connectors in the open source. And so if you're running, you know, a cloud error distribution of Hadoop, you're going to have the same connector that's running in cloud data proc. Uh, and it's fully supported across all the, you know, the major vendors. So, Data proc is how we kind of came into this talk because we're, we really wanted to do is, again, we're trying to go after that cloud native uh, uh, mentality of, you know, really when you have a job, it should be fire and forget. You don't necessarily have to worry about, you know, tuning what that cluster looks like. Our goal is to kind of abstract that for you, right? And so we have cloud auto scaling that's based on Yarn today. And we want to give you a lot of control over how that autoscaler works. So, you know, it's based on yarn pending memory. And <laughs> the more yarn pending memory it sees, the more we'll scale up that cluster and scale it back down. Now, that sounds great, right? That we should just be able to have this, uh, you know, this magical cluster that can scale up and scale back down. 
But there's a lot of challenges when it comes to actually auto-scaling, especially with Spark. So first of all, just Yarn, doing this off of Yarn, that brings a lot of baggage and a lot of infrastructure complexities with it, which I'll talk about more in a second. Then there's also the problem of like finding all this processed data. And Ben's going to talk about more uh, about what I mean here. But essentially, you have a lot of uh, Spark, it really was designed for these on-prem Hadoop clusters, and it's very stateful. And so it's just creating a lot of like cache DDs and spilling to disk, and a lot of the shuffle files all are expected to be on a worker. Uh, and that's just not great if you're trying to have you know, this ephemeral architecture where you're, you have clusters, VMs coming up and coming back down. And then finally, optimization of cost. Moving to the cloud, you're trying to you know, run these jobs and get as most compute resources that you can out of it for the amount of money that you're paying. And so cloud vendors typically have ways that you can optimize by using things like spot instances in AWS, or with us, they're called preemptible machines. And so how do you actually do that when you're supposed to have all this stateful data you know, that's expected to be around? So first of all, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about Yarn. So again, cloud data proc, our distribution, we are very much yarn focused uh, today, or at least historically we've been yarn focused. And the way it essentially works with Cloud Data Proc is we have an agent that sits on the machine, talks back, and then we manage yarn through this separate control plane. And then the, the VMs live in your per, uh, customer account. But yarn brings a lot of pain with it. So first of all, the management for yarn, it can get really difficult. Because what you find is that a lot of these different parts of even Spark, but like uh, rely on, it, it really expected like, uh, it, there's a lot of dependencies that Yarn kind of puts into place. So things that you would expect to be decoupled often aren't. You probably have found this with like, uh, like Spark SQL, where you, you end up with these like hive dependencies that you weren't expecting to be there. And then along with that, it just, because these different dependencies are all there and you've loaded up this big cluster of things, this monolithic cluster, it really complicates that open source software stack. So you end up with a bunch of version dependencies and things you weren't expecting. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, like what I'm talking about, you can go ask your cluster admin who probably did some install of a, you know, a, a Zeppelin notebook that stepped on some Java class path and then you know, screwed up all your Spark jobs. Like That's the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here. And with that, it's just really hard to isolate specific jobs and resources. And so this is why Google Cloud, along with many others in the community, uh, not just Google to be clear, uh, work together to bring the Kubernetes as a scheduler to Apache Spark. And you get the basic architecture of uh, how this works at a high level, uh, which I will kind of forego for now because I want to get to the auto-scaling stuff. But essentially, this is really our strategy moving forward from an open source uh, perspective of Cloud Data Proc and just Google Cloud in general. What we want to do is we want to bring the community uh, new ways to run these open source applications that have been around for a long time, that have been battle tested, that people want to use. But we want to do it in a very open source and cloud native way. So what we're going to do is with <coughs> um, a lot of these open source frameworks is we're going to give you an open source solution made by Google that will really kind of give you a, a way to get started and something you can go take, run yourself anywhere. Then just like you saw in the previous slides with the, you know, the management layer that we'll provide, we we'll also can give you a management layer on top of those various uh, open source distributions if you want those SLAs, if you want that additional support, if you want some additional uh, just abstraction from running infrastructure. And then finally, what you want to also make this very easy to extend for a lot of our partners so they can tap right into that exact same you know, infrastructure abstraction and not get hung up on doing integrations for the like, specific cloud providers, but just get into actually doing the higher level bits and the higher level open source things that matter to them. And so the way we're actually doing this uh, is with an approach called uh, Kubernetes operators. I don't know how many are you familiar with this approach, but the, the short version of what a Kubernetes operator is, is this is essentially an opinionated control plane that we will launch into Kubernetes for you. So without having to do a bunch of configurations and make decisions and write manifest files, you can just take what Google's opinion is on the best way to run an open this, a particular piece of open source framework, put it into Kubernetes, and go. And again, this is all open source. If you want to make your own tweaks to it, you absolutely can. Um, and so our first uh, venture into this space 
was specifically with a Spark operator. So this is again on GitHub, you can just take it, you can go. Uh, we have a bunch of integrations specific for the cloud in this operator. It'll set up the Kubernetes environment to what we think is kind of the best generic way to run it. Again, you can go optimize it if you want. And then we'll give you a bunch of integrations into the cloud that you don't have to spend time you know, doing yourself and you can just get back into actually processing uh, you know, your Spark jobs on Kubernetes. And so, <clears throat> again, it's available in GitHub, the source code. If you're in Google Cloud, you can just come into our marketplace and you know, in about two clicks of a next button, you can have it launched into your own Kubernetes cluster. But we also make a Helm chart available, so if you want to go run this on-prem or anywhere else, you, know, you can absolutely go do that. And so this Kubernetes approach is hopefully going to bring us some key benefits for auto-scaling just out of the box. So <clears throat> first of all, a lot of talent nowadays, uh, a lot of uh, basically administrating uh, talent, it's getting away from like yarn management. People just are sick of managing yarn or it's a kind of a specialized uh, skill set. And a lot of folks are really moving to you know, an all-in Kubernetes environment where all their web apps are running there. They know how to optimize that sort of thing. And so giving them that unified resource uh, capabilities is, a, is something that we want to enable. So it's going to help there, just you know, better people that know how to manage Kubernetes. Also, it's really going to hopefully help isolate a lot of those Spark jobs and resources. So if you have you know, data scientists that were uh, working on Spark 2.4 and they create a bunch of packages and configurations, they can run that on the exact same cluster infrastructure that, uh, that somebody, another data scientist wanted to try out like Spark 3 with, with their own different packages, and the two jobs never have to conflict. You don't have to go back and retest jobs just because you want to make an upgrade to the underlying system. All that can get a little bit more separated and isolated. And then with that, you just get a lot more resilient infrastructure. So just jobs are not going to go down. Things aren't going to break just because you've upgraded the underlying cluster. Things are containerized. <laughs> Okay, so all of that's helpful for you know, auto-scaling because we can start to break out jobs and piece them up, but it doesn't actually solve some of the core problems that Spark has when it comes to uh, downscaling specifically. Because we have to go back and we have to go and find a lot of those shuffle files and process data. And so for a second, I'm going to hand off to Ben, who's going to talk a little bit more uh, background about like, what am I talking about here about finding the process data and why do we care. Uh, so as Chris mentioned, uh, my name is Ben. I'm a software engineer on Cloud Dataproc, and I'm going to give you a, a quick overview of Shuffle. Uh, sorry for those of you who have gone to the, the uh, three other talks emphasizing Shuffle uh, today and between today and yesterday, uh, but obviously the fact that this is you know, so important to so many people uh, is reflected by that. Um, so what's Shuffle? Shuffle is uh, basically the, the, the core many-to-many -many operation that Spark has. It's, it's the one wi way to express wide dependencies. And what that means is that, in general, every single map task has to talk to every single reduced task, or rather has to get data from every single uh, map task. Uh, and the way that works uh, is, uh, well, actually, I'll, I'll go over the history first. So um, before, um, before the external shuffle service, which is what exists in Spark code right now, um, Spark depended on executors for, for shuffle files. And so the way it, the way it worked was, uh, every map every map executor uh, would take its data uh, and write it out to a different partition based on the out, based on where the data was supposed to end up going, uh, and that data was written to local disk. And then on the reduce side, uh, each reducer would talk to in general every other mapper uh, and fetch the data from that mapper. And in this uh, in this situation specifically, the executors themselves that ran the map tasks were responsible for serving the data. And so you can imagine uh, how this runs into issues when it comes to auto-scaling, specifically downscaling, because when an executor goes away, you lose the shuffle data. Uh, on top of that, it depended on, uh, on, the, on a driver GC event to actually clean up shuffle files. Um, so what we have now uh, is something called the external shuffle service. And uh, I put external in quotes here because uh, as far as Spark is aware, yes, it's external to the, uh, the executors themselves, but it's not external to the machines. So uh, what, this, what, what the new thing does is basically exactly what, what we did before. So you, you uh, as a mapper, take your map output, you, you shard it into the output partitions and write it to local disk. 
but then once the executor goes away, instead of, uh, instead of serving that traffic to reducers on request time, uh, there's an external service that you have to actually install on every node. And that, that service is responsible for, for serving data. So the executor can go away. You don't have dedicated Spark compute threads hogging uh, container resources on your cluster, but you still have to have the machine around uh, to serve the data. And actually, incidentally, it still depends on uh, a driver GC event to clean up shuffle files. Uh, so this is, I'm going to give you a, uh, an overview of the, of the shuffle manager code itself, which is how you plug into this process. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the shuffle manager interface itself is the, is the starting point. Uh, and on the driver, you have two, um, two callbacks that you, that you can basically register for, which is uh, register, register shuffle and unregister, suff, unregister shuffle. Uh, register shuffle is responsible for uh, taking in the, the, the shape of the shuffle, so you get the number of maps, uh, and uh, the shuffle dependency, which, in, which includes additional uh, information like how many output partitions are there, what kind of partitioner are you using, if, uh, the, if, the, if the input value type is different from the output value type of the shuffle process, for example, in a, uh, um, in, a, in a group by key, you start with you know, values and end up with a list of values for each key. Uh, it gives you a way to, to, to combine those. Uh, and then you also get a writer and a reducer. The writers and the reducers are actually uh, call, uh, or created on the uh, executors themselves, on, on the map and uh, reduce executors, respectively. And so I'm not going to go into the reader details because that's less, less important. But uh, this is what the shuffle writer interface looks like. Uh, so basically, you, get, you, you take in the records, uh, and then you have a, a, a method to, uh, stop the, to, to stop the shuffle write um, process for a given partition, and then you return the results. Uh, and so here is the, uh, here, here's the sort, short shuffle writer uh, implementation. And I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into the, to all of the, de the details, but the important part is that we're using an exter external sorter. So that's just, that's just an off-heap sorter that actually takes all of the, uh, all of the items uh, that were handed to it by the, by the mapper uh, and collates them. It, or it arranges them into, uh, or it groups them by output partition and then also possibly uh, by output type. Uh, and then after that, it takes the results of the, uh, of the sorter and it writes them to a local disk file. So this is the file that I was talking about before. Whether or not you're using the external shuffle service, uh, you, are, you are taking the, the sorted and collated output and writing it to local disk. Uh, I, I, I just included this here because there's something interesting. Actually, if you go back to this, if I go back to this other slide, you can see that uh, we're using a, uh, we are using the index, uh, index shuffle block resolver. And so because it depends on the data, the data format, um, of the index shuffle block resolver, these two files have to be kept in sync. Um, so it's another, it's another maintenance overhead. Uh, so there are problems with this. Chris had hinted at it uh, earlier, but uh, downscale is in, down, downscaling is infeasible in this situation because you can't take the machine away once, uh, once the map task is done. Uh, it also poses problems for uh, preemptible VMs and spot instances, spot instances uh, in, which, in which case, a machine might get preempted at any point in time. It might disappear, and you're not going to get that disk back. Or if you do, you may have lost state, uh, and, and you, you can't retrieve the shuffle data anymore. So it's all about optimizing costs. PVMs are, PVMs are useful because they can be substantially cheaper. Spot instances as well. Uh, PVMs have a fixed pricing model. Spot instances, uh, spot instances are based on uh, an auction model. But the idea is that you, you know, you're, you're foregoing uh, you're foregoing deterministic computation uh, in favor of uh, cheaper prices. And so I'm going to give an illustration of uh, exactly what things look like uh, in the case of preemptible VMs specifically. So here you have a shuffle. Uh, and each of these blocks on the left represents uh, a map task. And each of the blocks on the right represents a reduced task or, or partition. So you have the mappers and they're writing their data. And so this all, this, these all live on local, local disk. Right? And then uh, the map stage is complete. So the mappers have done all of their work, and they, they don't, the, the map executors can go away. But the machines are still sticking around and serving shuffle data. So you can see here, from, from each reducer, we're pulling the corresponding reduce data. And you notice that one mapper, one mapper got preempted, but everything else failed. Why is that? 
every, all, all of the reduce tasks failed because they were all reading from that same map task. And so now because, it, because we don't have that data anymore, we have to recompute it. So how do we fix it? Well, the simplest solution is just uh, move the intermediate data off of the, off of the compute cluster itself. So move it, move it off of the, not just the executors, but off of the machines that are doing the, the work in your Spark cluster. So this was our first iteration. This, uh, we called it the HCFS Shuffle Writer. HCFS stands for Hadoop Compatible File System. That's just, uh, it's basically a facade that matches the facade of uh, HDFS. So you can write to H HDFS or uh, in our case, uh, you have the option of using uh, the Google Cloud Storage Connector, so G GCS or Amazon S3 or any, anything that, that implements this interface. Uh, and so what we're doing, you can see it's very similar to, to the original implementation. So we create a sorter and we merge and call it all the stuff, all, 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 of the, uh, all of the input records. But instead of writing to local disk, we write directly to uh, HDFS. Okay. Yeah, so when Ben came up with that uh, implementation, I heard, as the product manager, I'm like, that's great. Let's put it out there because, you know, HCFS, that is a lot of different things. Uh, and so we wanted to, like, we have a couple of different experiments that we could go and try to shuffle things to because there's just a lot of different HCFS implementations out there. So we put this out as an alpha just to say, hey, anyone that wants to go try this, and this is an, uh, you can go and just start experimenting with shuffling things to other places. And so the obvious place to start shuffling to with HCFS is, hey, why not try HDFS? So Ben, how did that go? Uh, so yeah, HDFS, <laughs> it turns out, was not a panacea, is not a panacea. Uh, there's a lot of RPC overhead because you're talking to HDFS. Uh, it's not specifically, HDFS was not designed around the use case of many, 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 many uh, clients talking to the, same, uh, to the same file, let alone the same blocks within a file, because if you're partitioning using, you know, using the recommended uh, partition sizes, uh, you're, or use, you know, such that you get really small tasks, you'll end up with partitions that are maybe tens of kilobytes in size, or tens to hundreds of kilobytes in size, which is far below uh, the standard block size. Um, there's also a lot of, uh, so, you, so you, you lose the implicit in-memory storage uh, or in-memory in page cache that you would get in the case of serving local files. So in the case where you have uh, the external shuffle service, uh, which is included in Spark right now, uh, all of the requests for, of, of a given mapper go through the same machine. And so that machine gets to cache that in memory, and so the, the, those requests are cheaper. Uh, and then also you get name node contention, as I mentioned before, because all of these all of these uh, reducers are are writing to or or rather reading from the same files, you get contention. Uh, and then on top of that, there's a lot of additional metadata tracking that you have to do because um, because Spark is no longer keeping track of where the blocks live on your behalf. So. Okay, so HDFS didn't quite work out, but no problem, Ben, because HDFS it's old. That's not what you want to use. What you definitely want to try to use is go out and use cloud storage. That's our object store. It's a lot like S3 if you're familiar with that model. You know, huge pipes come into this. It's new. There's no name node. This will work great, right? Uh, unfortunately, GCS <laughs> has very similar problems to HDFS. It, it, it's shaped similarly. Uh, you know, it's optimized for different different types of things, but you still run into uh, to slowdown issues. And so here's a here's a graph of uh, or a chart rather of uh, shuffle performance uh, of a 100 gigabyte shuffle job. And we varied the number of reduced partitions and the number of map partitions. And you can see how when you use very, very, when you use relatively few partitions, that's what's happening in the bottom left corner, or sorry, the, the top left corner. Uh, the slowdown is not too bad, but when you get, when you end up with tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of reduces, which I didn't even bother to plot here, this, the, the slowdown is super linear. So if you have twice as many output partitions, it's not, it's not just going to be you know, twice as slow. It's substantially slower. Uh, for the reason the reasons that I had illustrated earlier. Okay, so it didn't work out to do the first two implementations, but this is a common problem. This is like the third talk I've seen on this just today uh, here. So the open source community's got to be working on this, right? So I found a project, you know, Apache, it's incubating in Apache Crail. And like, read this, like high performance distributed storage designed for fast sharing of ephemeral data in distributed data processing workloads. This sounds perfect for shuffle. Ben, please use this. Yeah, I mean, it sounds great. It's fast, heterogeneous, mo modular. Uh, so it turns out I, I was actually able to run a successful shuffle on 10 gigabytes of data, and it ran great, and everything was, was beautiful. Uh, and then I tried scaling up, and things just kind of fell apart. 
so I, you know, there are a lot of deadlocks in the code. Uh, it's sort of sort of resource grade and 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 not ready, uh, not ready for performance at this kind of scale. So we had the option of, uh, you know, kind of taking this over and, and attempting to productionize it for for real workloads, but we figured maybe there's an easier way around it. Yeah, because I, I got Google technology here, right? I got. So I'm looking around like at my own internal technology, and we got this thing called Big Table, right? It's our NoSQL store, full HBase compatibility. This is the thing that like when you're driving down the highway and your GPS is giving you, you know, real-time updates, this is what's backing it. Cloud Big Table. So this has definitely got to have that low latency, high throughput, like perfect, I can put shuffle data here, right? You would think so. Okay. But actually, so so we did actually try this. Uh, and it turns out that Big Table is designed for very high throughput and tons of clients running in parallel, and it works great for random access. And so I was able to get really great read throughput and really great write throughput. So that is both from the mapper and the reducer side. Unfortunately, given a particular data layout, I wasn't able to get good write throughput and good read, good read throughput on the same job. So I had to optimize it. So I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with, with how Big Table works, but you have to explicitly provide uh, your own key space, uh, and, their impl and keys are implicit or Rather, rows are implicitly ordered by key, and so you can group th you can group things such that the output partitions are the same or the input partitions are the same, and so you get hot spotting on different sides, either on the map side or the reduced side, and it ends up not working that well uh, in a general in ge general shuffle use case. Okay, but essentially, shuffle is going to a file system, and so about the time that uh, Bigtable wasn't working out, we uh, at Google Cloud happened to have an acquisition of this company, Elastifile, who offers cloud scaling NFS. So hey, NFS, that could work, right? That seems kind of crazy. I mean, NFS, that's like from the, you know. The that's days, what you're right? doing on yeah. Shuffle, right? So it's going to NFS. How'd this so, 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 so I actually I experimented with this, and it actually seems to solve most of our issues. There are, there, there are there, there's still some problems, so I'm not, I'm not going to say it doesn't come with, with caveats. But Elastifile has uh, horizontal scaling, and it's specifically tailored uh, around the, uh, tailored to address the small files problem and random access. Uh, there are some weird issues with it because NFS looks like a local file system, unlike unlike HDFS, you, which you know, you know, in, in which you know you're talking to a remote file system, and there are certain guarantees, at least in, in the HDFS layer and on object store layers. NFS doesn't have that. You don't have uh, you don't have things like atomic renames, for example. So you have to be careful when you're dealing with uh, commit sam sam commit semantics and speculative execution. But once you get around those, you do take a performance hit. Uh, but it runs usually within a factor of two or so uh, of of the uh, of, of the regular shuffle, and so combined with the with, with the cheaper prices uh, due to the uh, you know the PVM model and, and and the ability to downscale and actually utilize your resources, it tends to work pretty well. Yeah. So that is basically the state of where we are. So this is our goal. This is uh, I want to be clear. This is uh, not uh, fully implemented today, but this is where we're headed is we want to, again, going back to the Google approaches, we want to put an open source solution out there that anyone can take, modify, run, and then we'll come back and put that management layer on top. This is our goal for the, you know, the open source implementation that we want to put out there. We're going to uh, hopefully work on ha uh, having it Kubernetes, because that's going to solve a lot of these like, uh, isolation issues at the specific job level for auto scaling. And then what we want to do is try to, uh, this already exists today on the right-hand side, is the, uh, the, uh, the Google Cloud Kubernetes operator does offload you know, its, uh, to Google Cloud Storage for your like, job inputs and job uh, exports. But for this Elastifile, it's going to probably live on VMs for the time being for a lot of reasons I won't go into right now, but it's going to just be a better fit for the VM model. But Kubernetes can still speak to it. The biggest gap that exists today is a lot of that external shuffle that Ben was talking about doesn't quite work in Kubernetes because essentially what you kind of have to do is you almost have to end up with like two pods and then one pod is isolated from the other pod from reaching in and actually getting the, the data. And so we are working on a shuffle offload that will hopefully uh, you know, help us get to Elastifile. Uh, I don't know if anyone was in the Palantir talk, I think, two sessions ago, apparently they were also working on this exact same problem, so we'll probably you know, reach out to them and see if we could maybe work together on this particular problem. Um, and so that's our goal, is to get this into the open source, so hopefully you know, uh, that will come soon. And then the next we want to look at is that management layer and what we can provide, because internally at Google and Google Cloud, we do have a lot of other services that shuffle data. For instance, we have things like uh, BigQuery, 
which is our fully managed serverless data warehouse that has its own shuffle implementation, or even with Apache Beam and Dataflow, they have a shuffle implementation. And so we're also looking at, in a managed version, could we actually shuffle to you know, one of our other uh, cloud products? And so with that, uh, we will end a little early, so I think we have time for questions if uh, anyone has them. Any questions from the audience? Hi. How long it took to, ta to test all the options? Sorry. How long it, long it took to test, test all the options? Uh, I don't know. A, a long time. I just let. I just. I, I created a grid and just let it run overnight, over like a day or two. So I can't actually. I can't actually tell you. On the order of hours, many hours. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the insights. Uh, the Palantir talk you mentioned, uh, am I correct that for the moment you're still using shuffles to the local machine, right? Uh, sorry, in, in which situation? For this, for this current moment, you don't have this uh, separate service no, for we shuffle? Do, we, we do. Uh, yeah, ah, so you we actually, actually yeah, do. So that was that enhanced flexibility mode that we put so, out. Yes, so okay, so, so no local shuffles. So okay, so that's not quite so that's not quite right. So we have we have a, a feature called EFM where we on, on cloud data proc where we allow you to, sh to shuffle to HCFS. I haven't actually merged. We haven't merged the changes for NFS yet. Okay. But once those go in, it'll it'll be live. If you're asking about Spark upstream, Spark mainstream, it has it's it, it is all done in local files. So. Okay, and actually, why I was asking because they ran the problem that. Uh, in Kubernetes, uh, you work with uh, file disk cache quite differently mm -hmm. than while you are running on Yarn. <coughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, and so that's kind of where the external shuffle comes in. We got to get it off of the pod. Exactly. Uh, yeah. The volumes are just yeah too slow for, I guess the yeah the reason they went into. Hey, thanks for your talk. It was quite excellent. Um, I wanted to ask about the security uh, perspective of using NF something like NFS. So uh, my understanding is that NFS is a um, well, it's a shared like file system across like all of the applications that run on the cluster. So how are we guaranteeing that um, two pods can't basically access each other's shuffle files? There? So so we're not guaranteeing that. And uh, like I mean, th this this is a very early iteration. This is, this is a prototype right now. But in general, you would not be able to do that. Uh, the only thing I can imagine, the only way I can imagine to do that is either lock down NFS such that you have isolation between users and you can't you can't sh you know different users reside on different networks and are completely disconnected. Or you take advantage of, uh, of the Spark, uh, Spark, managed, uh, uh, Spark managed encryption and actually use per user encryption keys or something to that effect. That, so that, that, that's something we're thinking about, but not something that we've addressed yet. Uh, but again, encryption should be able to solve that, even in the, in, in, in the face of multi-tenancy and shared network. So. So in, in this model where you're streaming shuffle files onto, onto an NSF drive, do you also keep a local copy as well? So if the machine is not preempted, that um, the, the communication goes directly so, to the local So node? no, we, we don't do that. We don't do that. And I, I actually, I, I know that in the Palantir talk they were talking about uh, having done, you know, having, having used that, having, having attempted to use that and then falling back to remote uh, disk if necessary. Uh, so we don't do that because, in, because our interest in this case is specifically scaling down, not just not just running on Kubernetes at all, but but scaling down rapidly, and um, and doing so. Uh, it's it's difficult. So when you when a task is preempted in uh, in Spark, Spark knows about that, and it, it marks the executive <coughs> loss. Right. So if if a map task is is, is lost as it's going, Spark will will, will rerun that. In the case where the map task has already completed, as soon as one failed read happens, Spark will actually uh, resubmit that map task, and so you have to make some you have to make subtle changes to the scheduler to make it aware that okay, in some cases a loss is okay, in some cases a loss is not okay. It's actually a little bit weird in in the case of um, in the case of the, the backup because you might have uh, a failed a, a failed backup, but also a uh, you know failed failed local cache or something to that effect. Um, can uh, uh, in the case of uh, 
Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, in the case of uh, data proc on Kubernetes, which uh, I think you uh, launched beginning of September, um, can can data proc be data proc be uh, plugged on an existing Kubernetes instance, or can the underneath Kubernetes cluster be used for other deployments than uh, just uh, Spark? So, you want to answer that? Sure. Yeah, uh, you, you can go to an existing Kubernetes instance. You don't have to manage an instance. Uh, the uh, all the all what the service actually is is it's a unified control plane across Spark and Kubernetes. But the way it actually gets implemented is just a Helm chart and a Docker file that's running our agent. So that combination is all it takes, and you can basically put that onto you know anything that uh, speaks that is a Kubernetes cluster, and it will now be part of like the data proc interface. You get the security controls, you get the APIs, you get the logging, etc. Okay, and uh, is uh, in terms of uh, entry points for Spark, Spark applications, do we? Uh, only have Spark submit, or can you push like a descriptive YAML file, uh, like you would for? Yeah, you can push. Pop? So both. Uh, so uh, you you can push a descriptive YAML file that's based on the Spark operator. So the same YAML file that that uses, you can submit it that way. Uh, Cloud Data Proc, what like what we offer is our own uh, jobs API, and so for the most part, that's how people would submit it uh, a Spark job. Yeah, so just the usual Spark submit on the airport. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Any more? Oh. Nice talk. Uh, so now there is this uh, different kind of a shuffle that is pretty much implemented and a remote one, right? So is there any optimizations, uh, any, any scope for further optimizations you see because of that? You know, one example could be uh, probably, you know, this is not an example of optimization, but would you need compression because this is a network kind of a right. right now? Would it help? And the other optimization is probably, you know, since uh, all the keys are anyways being written to the same location, would it make sense to merge it beforehand right. itself and stuff yeah. like that? So I, I have answers to both of those because those are those are things that we have definitely thought about. And uh, and we, we, so we've played with compression. Compression doesn't seem to work. It doesn't seem to help as much as you might hope just because we in, in the cloud we have such such wide pipes, so the, the, the bandwidth is not usually uh, as big of a constraint as you might expect. Um, but as far as merging goes, the problem with, with doing that is that you'd have to actually ship out the function that's doing the merging in that situation, right? So you have to have some sort of live service. And so we've been looking, Chris, Chris was talking about you know, using, using some truly external uh, managed shuffle service that's running on your behalf that could do that. Unfortunately, the way that Spark is written today, you can't really do that. You don't want to have. You don't, we don't want to be shipping arbitrary, uh, you know, serialized function calls on, on to, onto onto our, onto external servers just to do some merging of files. Uh, but we, what we could do is say, okay, here's a special, you know, here's, here's a special serialized type that indicates that we're just going to group by key. And then you have the additional problem that, okay, in in Spark, serializers are not required to be deterministic. And so what that means is that the bytes the bytes level representation of a given object is not necessarily the same even if the two objects are seen as equal in, in Scala code, right? They might, they might appear different uh, on the wire. And so because of that, you can't actually fully group. You can maybe do a best effort, but you can't say, okay, from the shuffle service side, all of the, all of the values that I'm giving you back have already been grouped and combined and everything, and, and you're good to go just start processing the data. The, the reducer would still need to, uh, to do some merging on their own end. And so at that point, you're not gaining that much. But th there, are, there are some ways around this, and I, like, I, I would like to, to start that conversation with... Uh, with, with the you know with the Spark community because I think that's something that Spark could benefit from. But awesome! Thanks for the questions, everybody, um, and please don't forget to review the session in the app. Um, and I'm sure Ben and Chris will kind of be hanging out after the session due to answer any additional questions.